from this session. It's another bit of a technical one in a way, but it's a very important one for people to understand. It's all about permanent establishment, PEs, and profits for permanent establishment, and also business profits that are arising in different jurisdictions and how they're taxed. And the concept of permanent establishments um, is very important to determining where the tax base is going to be for a particular company uh, or a particular entity. And there are different things that can constitute permanent establishments. And there are different things that are exempt from being permanent establishments, as we've seen earlier on, um, under, the, uh, under the different double tax treaties that we have a look at. Um, we're going to look in more detail in this session at what the definition of a permanent establishment is and what that actually means for tax purposes. So once we know we've got a permanent establishment, so what? Uh, how does that affect the tax position of our client company? Um, and we want to look, as part of that, at the key bits of the tax treaties. We've already done this. This will, to some extent, be reinforcing it, but we're looking at it in a bit more detail. Look at the key clauses in double tax treaties that help us to define what a, what a permanent establishment is. And as part of that, we'll be looking at the exemptions. Because if you remember, tax treaties don't actually tax you. They just exempt you or they relieve you from taxes. So all that is happening under a tax treatment is that it's applying another definition that goes on top of the local jurisdiction. Um, now, remember, though, in this case, if it's extending the definition of a permanent establishment, that does override the domestic law in that respect. The domestic law still has to apply a tax charge, and it could have something else that means there isn't a tax charge on the PE. But the definition of PE can be overridden, uh, uh, can override a domestic uh, definition, and the exemptions can override a lack of exemption under the domestic arrangements. So the tax treaty definitions and exemptions are important. We'll say a bit in this about the OECD commentary on this because that gives a clue to not only the definition of a, of a permanent establishment but also the manner in which permanent establishments can be taxed because there can be some odd things about the taxation of permanent establishment that, establishments that can produce some pretty awful results in the wrong circumstances. And I just want to touch on what some of those points are. OK, is everybody happy with that as agenda? Yes, I hope so, because it's the only agenda I got. I promise never to make that joke again. OK, um, what's, what's all this about? What's all this about permanent establishments? What are you on about? Well, imagine the situation. We've got one, uh, so we've got one company in a state, and it's undertaking business with, in another state. Okay, But we haven't set up another company in that other state. We haven't deliberately created any kind of entity that's recognised in that other state. But we could still have a permanent establishment in that other state. And a permanent establishment in that other state might mean that we have an entity there that can be taxed. And so we technically don't have a taxable presence. We don't think we've got a taxable presence. But actually, the permanent establishment crosses the threshold and means that we do have a taxable presence. We have gone beyond doing business with the other jurisdiction, to doing business in, to trading in the other jurisdiction. That's the distinction. If you remember that, then you'll be on the right lines with what is a permanent establishment and what isn't. The concept of permanent establishment is intended to extend the territoriality of any country's tax system to anybody who is trading in the country, but not to somebody who's trading with the country. Does that make sense? And can you see where that's quite a narrow dividing line, isn't it? You can be selling goods to somebody, and the customers there can be running around buying those goods from you. And if that's over the internet, and all you're getting is getting those goods delivered to the company, a country, then that's absolutely fine. Because can you can straight away imagine how that trade might in practice work. And as you do that, you'll straight away start to see that there are facets of any arrangement that you have to make that trade work with the other country, that automatically start making you wonder whether you have created a taxable entity in that other country, just by the nature of the way that trade operates. It's quite difficult just to trade with another country without somehow spilling over into trading in that country. And that's what this session's all about. Okay.
As for an overview, we can say this. The concept of permanent establishment, as I say, is intended to bring within the territorial scope of a country's tax system any entity that is trading in that jurisdiction, whatever that means. And you have definitions of what are permanent establishments, as we've seen from earlier on, in double tax treaties, in the bilateral, uh, bilateral double tax treaties. And very, very broadly, a permanent establishment treatment will apply to something which is a fixed, what does that mean, place of business through which the business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. Fixed, and a business of an enterprise has got to be carried on through it. Those terms aren't just random. They do have meaning and they do have significance. And we need to understand those in detail before we can spot what is a PE. But even if we have got something that falls in that definition, it may well be that it isn't a PE because it falls within one of the exclusions. But remember, we mentioned this earlier on, when you are looking at the exclusions that apply for entities that would otherwise be permanent establishments, remember you are only falling within the exclusion if the activity you're carrying on is of a preparatory or auxiliary nature. So if it's the crux of what you do, then it's a PE anyway. If it's just on the edges of what you do, or it's intended to help you do what you really do when you finally get round to really doing it in that particular jurisdiction, then you might be fine. So just be aware of the limitations of the definition, of the limitation of the scope of those exemptions as we're going through this. Okay. Okay, if you have a situation where you have an entity overseas and you weren't intending that to be a taxable entity in the jurisdiction uh, where you're trading, you thought you were just trading with that jurisdiction, but actually you have crossed over the line and you have now got something that means you have got a PE, you want to be aware of it pretty quick and you want to react to it pretty quickly. Because the fact of the matter is you've probably got an entity that does have a tax presence in that jurisdiction and needs to be disclosed as such. And it possibly has exposure to local direct taxes. It possibly has uh, exposure to indirect taxes, to local VAT or the equivalent sales taxes and other taxes that might apply. And that's bound to put some kind of compliance burden on the entity as well. It's almost certainly got to be putting in some kind of returns or notifying the local tax or taxing authorities of its existence and of the fact that it is carrying on a business or trade in that jurisdiction. So where you identify that you have got a PE, you look at the exemptions, blimey, we don't fall into the, any of the exemptions. Oh, uh, my God, clearly we are trading in that jurisdiction, not just with it. That's the way to react to it. Uh, you can get it sorted out and get it disclosed as quickly as possible and deal with the tax consequences arising from that afterwards. In practice, it looks like this. Basically, you've got to have a situation to worry about a permanent establishment. As we said before, you've got to have obviously two jurisdictions. You've got to have a legal entity in one jurisdiction, that's the country of residence, and then in the other jurisdiction, the source country, the country where you're getting the income from, where the business is going on, where you're doing the trade that we're worried about. It may only be a bit of the trade of this legal entity, by the way. It may be all of it, who knows. But you've got the other jurisdiction, the source country, and that's where we might have the PE. So you might have this, you might have a company that's set up in the country of residence, and then you've got something going on in Japan, not a subsidiary set up in Japan, not a partnership set up in Japan, not a foundation or a charity or anything else set up in Japan. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, is that enough? Is what's going on in Japan enough to mean that we have a PE in Japan? And it's largely, as I said already, that's, the, that's really the borderline that we're looking to see if we've crossed. Have we gone from trading with Japan to trading in Japan. If we've gone from trading with Japan to trading in Japan, I'm almost going to burst into song here, um, then we have created a permanent establishment and we do have tax consequences that flow from that. Ah, it's working now. Yeah, okay. 
Basic point is that in, under international tax law, uh, you can't be taxed everywhere, can you? Just because you happen to be doing business with another country, it doesn't mean you should fall within their tax regime, not at all. So where should your profits be taxed? And the basic concept is that you should only be taxed in the country in which you are resident. And then it's only if you've stepped over that line and you've got enough of a presence in another country to mean that really you should be operating, I suppose, through something that is a resident of that country. So you really legitimately fall within the scope of their tax rules. That's the only point when you should be being taxed in the source state, in the state where you're doing the business. That's really the fundamental principle that these rules are intending to uh, embody. Now, double tax treaties are very, very useful in helping us to define and identify where we have got a PE and where we don't have a PE. And Article 5.1 is the key one. Uh, this defines a PE, or it says that a double tax treaty should define a PE in the following way. So it should be where you've got a permanent, where you've got a fixed place of business through which the business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. Now, um, this is helpful, isn't it? Fixed place means the place of business must be fixed. Excellent. Here we go with these useful interpretations again in the, in the legislation and in the tax treaties. Um, but there's something a bit more helpful later on. Some degree of permanence. You don't have a permanent establishment, as the name suggests, unless it is a fixed place with some degree of permanence. So where you have somebody wandering around on a temporary contract trying to find you customers, that almost certainly isn't within that definition. And actually, as we saw earlier, it's covered by a specific exemption anyway in most double tax treaties. Where you've got a building, well, the building's fixed, the building's pretty permanent, uh, not with all the builders I've had working for me in, uh, in the past, but a building's generally pretty permanent. Um, so a building would clearly be something which is a fixed place uh, with some degree of permanence. And then you've only got to decide whether the business is being carried on there through that fixed place. And here we have another helpful definition. Carried on means the enterprise must wholly or partly carry on its business through the fixed, uh, fixed place. Well, thanks, a bundle. Um, what does that mean? Well, again, we have to drill down into... There are some things we can infer from this that is that's more helpful than that wording actually implies. Um, and there, are, there is some guidance already, even in, uh, even in the wording that we've got here. So this is in the Article 5.1. This is usually interpreted with a very wide scope. Great, OK. Meaning any activity related to the business of an enterprise conducted by persons. Now, this is useful. Conducted by persons who are dependent on the enterprise. So where they're independent of the enterprise, What's that mean? Then we might be OK. But where they're dependent on the enterprise, then we probably have a PA. Such as employees, well, that's helpful, because we know if we're trying to avoid a, a PA, actually having a place where there are people who are employed by us, physically present and working, probably puts us alongside of the PA definition, assuming we don't want there to be a PA. Or dependent agents, that's greyer. Because we might want to employ agents, we might want to use agents who aren't employees, and we might, want to, um, we might want to get them working for us on a contract basis, or just on a commission basis, a commissionaire arrangement. But are they dependent upon us? What does that mean? And we'll look at that as we go along. <coughs> now, here it gets a bit easier. And there's some bits in this definition. We did look at this earlier uh, in, in the anti-avoidance section. But there are a couple of bits in this definition which are really easy. I always think, I always imagine the people that sit down and draft this stuff, they probably think, oh, we'll put that down anyway, that's nice and easy. Then they start to get onto the complex bits and they start to get a bit more worried. Uh, because I've got to say, some of the easy stuff on this makes it very, very easy indeed. And um, nobody would have any particular problem with any of this. Uh, a permanent establish inclu establishment includes an office, a factory, a workshop, a mine, an oil well, uh, an oil or gas well, quarry, or other place of extraction of natural resources. Does anybody think they will have any problem spotting any of those? Um, if you come across a quarry, you'll know about it. Uh, you'll fall in it. Um, if, well, you won't, you'll stop. Uh, if you come across a workshop, you'll probably be able to identify that. If you come across a factory, you'll probably be able to identify that. And if you come across an office, you'll probably be able to identify that. We'll talk about home offices in a bit. Um, but what about the others? And we had the question earlier on, didn't we? Place of management. 
well, hang on, what's that about? Is that to do with management of control? No, it's not actually. It's nothing to do with management of control. It's a place from which activities going on in that source jurisdiction are managed. It might be an office, well, that helps us, but it might be somebody's front room. Is that, so, is that, has that got the right degree of permanence? Uh, come on to that in a bit. Um, but there may be a management activity taking place from that. So, you know, some kind of rented office uh, not even being used as an office, but be only being used as the desk for somebody who's actually managing a team of people who otherwise would be commissionaires or would be non-dependent agents. That might give you a place of management there, so that's something to look out for. And we always have the building site thing, and we mentioned this earlier on. Uh, the OECD convention defines a building site as a building site that lasts last for, uh, last for 12 months. And the UN Convention, the Standard Convention, defines a building site as something uh, that lasts for uh, six months. So the, so the UN one is MENA and actually applies it um, uh, more easily. You've got to consider when a building site actually starts, when a building site ends, and there is some guidance from the OECD on that. But where you've got a building site, in other words, where you have a company in the jurisdiction where we're giving the advice, and we're advising them on some, a project that they're undertaking in another, another country, and it involves a building, it involves some building project, then that is a building site that could come within this definition, couldn't it? If it's there for more than 12 months. And I've got to say, most building sites probably are there for, a lot of them are there for more than 12 months. So you've got to be quite careful. And we've got to look at the guidance about when that building site is no longer a building site. Really relevant, some of the clients I used to advise, architects and so on, although uh, because they would be working on projects where they would have access to and they'd, they'd effectively own for a period of time the site or they'd have a lease over the site on which the project was being undertaken so that could fall within that definition. There's more requirements of the site and of the entity or the building which we'll touch on as we go through this. Okay, um, the, uh, this is the point that a building site uh, has got to, be, got to last more than 12 months. And like I said, there is some guidance on this. Um, and a um, couple of things uh, that the OECD tell us, which is uh, helpful on this. Uh, and that is that, um, they're not, well, I said they're helpful. They, they tend to work the wrong way for us. So, for example, if you have a temporary period during which the site is not being um, is not being used or not being operated, if that's seasonal, so you just stop during a particularly hot month or something, or you stop during a particularly wet season uh, to, for the building, that doesn't stop it being, you don't stop counting the 12 months. Uh, so your 12 months will still be carrying on. So that isn't actually particularly, uh, particularly helpful in that regard. Um, and um, uh, similarly, you can have a situation where work is carried on on a site after the main building project is completed. And if work does con uh, continue on a site after the building work is completed, if that is work you're contractually obliged to undertake, and you've got to do that as part of the agreement that you've got with, this, with the customer for whom you're working, then in that situation the building site does continue. So in other words, you may think the building's up and done, but actually, in the contract, you've got to come back and arrange for the fitting of new windows on a particular part of the building. The building site would still exist. So it's actually quite easy to cross that 12-month timeline where you've got a building site. So uh, something to be aware of. The other thing that we don't have on building sites, we don't have any guidance about when they start, which is um, the one thing I mentioned earlier. And of course, I found that a bit odd because you know the, you can own a site, you can have access to a site, but you can be waiting for people to come along and the right things to start happening. You might level a site um, and then do nothing on it. At what point does it start to be a building site? And I'm afraid there's precious little guidance on that. Everyone assumes that you know when it started. It's kind of when you, you, know, when you put a, sh a shovel in the ground and then uh, it stops and there's plenty of guidance on, on when it stops. There's quite a bit of guidance on when it stops, uh, but less on when it starts. Now, I said there were other requirements of a place for it to be a permanent establishment. Not only do you have to have either a building, or you have to have a place of management, or you have to have a factory, or you have to have a building site that's there for more than 12 months, but any of these entities need to be at the disposal of the enterprise. So we're on about a company in the UK uh, undertaking business in Japan, 
the building site in Japan has got to be at the disposal of the UK entity. What does that mean, do we think? Any thoughts? What's at the disposal of somebody mean? Do they need to own it? No, no thank you. Well, what, uh, I, th I think that's entirely right. What do you think then it means? Yeah, I think it's availability, really. I think uh, during the period when we're testing whether or not it's a PE, I think they would have to have some unfettered or reasonably unfettered access to it. So you've either got, you might be renting it for a period. You might have an agreement whereby you can go and use it for a period. Uh, you might have a short lease or a long lease or whatever. But you've got to have, it's got to be available. And I think if it's not available, if you can't actually go out there and do something with it, then I don't think it is at your disposal. Um, so... That brings into question things like, you know, if you're, just, if you're just using something on a really ad hoc arrangement, but there's no formal agreement whereby when you can, you know, whereby, uh, how, that, uh, how that use ends, then there might be a question mark of whether that is at your disposal, if it can be taken away at any point. Uh, usual thing, what we're talking about here is we're taking uh, definitions from the OECD model treaty for the purpose of this presentation. But remember, you do need to go and look at the individual tax treaties to make sure um, that uh, you've got the, uh, the, um, uh, you, you, you're looking at the right, the right um, provisions. Um, and remember, there is this concept of being fixed as well. A place of business to be fixed must have a specific geographic location. Uh, but it doesn't need to be something bolted to the ground. Uh, you can have machinery talks about here as being as constituting a permanent establishment because it is something that is at your disposal and it might be it might constitute in itself a workshop it doesn't actually have to be the building itself um, and so um, something made up of uh, machine or equipment um, doesn't have to actually be fixed to the ground so you could have something that's potentially movable um, but it's for whatever reason sitting in one place so some degree of permanence uh, that could itself constitute a PE. So we've mentioned already that what we need to have is we need to have a fixed place of business. It needs to be something fixed, not necessarily nailed to the ground, but kind of in one place, I think, is what fixed means. It's got to be staying around for a little while. Um, it's got to be a, a, pla a fixed place of business through which the business of the enterprise is wholly or partially carried on. Um, and what the characteristics of this would be that yeah it's got to be fixed so some kind of physical place something or physical thing that you can go and point to and say where it is you'd have to be able to say where this is in order for this to be um, a fixed uh, uh, a fixed um, um, place uh, it's got to be at the disposal of the enterprise but as we said that doesn't necessarily mean the enterprise needs to own it the enterprise in the words uh, from the front row here, the enterprise just needs to have access to it. It just needs to be available to the enterprise, but in some kind of sustainable way. So it's got some element of permanence. If you've just broken into a building and you're squatting in it for a bit, then that probably wouldn't constitute a permanent establishment. Um, not a recommendation again, please, ladies and gentlemen. Just a silly example. The point being that you can't rely on being able to have access to that for any period of time. But um, what sort of period do we need for that to be uh, at the disposal of the enterprise? Well, for it to be at the disposal of the enterprise, it probably doesn't matter what the period is. But remember that we do need some degree of permanence. So there's got to be some degree of permanence. And is a, is a one-month contract something that's permanent? I wouldn't say so. Uh, we know 12 months is something that's permanent because that's all they require a building site to last for. So... You know, I think um, anything over a year where you're renting something, I think then you probably would be getting into the concept of it being a permanent arrangement. Um, it needs to be a place of business. Now, there's two interesting examples there. It needs to be a place through which the business is carried on. What does that mean? And that doesn't necessarily need to be people functions, does it? It could be automated functions that go on through that place. So a computer server could constitute a permanent establishment and I have seen that argument with HMRC uh, with them um, with an online gambling company uh, that I used to do some work for um, 
And um, similarly, the example here, which I think is quite a good one actually, is a pipeline. I mean, a pipeline is something through which you conduct your business, um, you know, an element of your business. You've got to send the oil or gas through the pipeline from uh, location A to location B. Uh, in a very literal sense, your business is passing through that, um, but you are conducting your business through that. Is that enough for that to be a PE? Probably, actually. Um, so it is a place where your business is undertaken. But remember, your business being undertaken doesn't need to be the entirety of your business. Your business is wholly or partly undertaken there. You can take a bit of your business that's undertaken there. And so even these things can constitute per, per, uh, permanent establishments. Um, but it's still through which the business is carried on, through which the business is carried on. So it's got to, for it to be a permanent establishment, the argument would be, it's got to look like an office or look like a place of business or have something that means you can attribute to that the characteristics of somewhere where a business would be carried on. So some level of equipment for carrying on a business. So you, you, the question here is, could a hotel room qualify as a permanent establishment? Probably unlikely, actually, uh, because the argument would be anyway. I mean, if you're just using a hotel room for somebody to you know, go and stay in while they act as a commissionaire or agent for you, and you don't have the other attributes that mean that they themselves create a permanent establishment, if they're just using a hotel room, well, yeah, it's at your disposal, but only because you're, you're paying for the hotel. I mean, I've got a hotel room tonight that's at my disposal. Tomorrow night it's not, because I'll have gone back home. Um, so, you know, you can't really say that's at some, is, is that really at your disposal? Well, only so long as you pay the room rent and any uh, pay for the hotel room and any hotel is at anyone's disposal isn't it in that sense so that would be a silly uh, silly um, uh, conclusion to draw so in most circumstances just the fact that somebody's staying in a hotel pointing to the hotel as being a PE would probably be a silly conclusion so question for you all could working from home constitute a permanent establishment what's the arguments about working from home when does working from home when does your home become a PE do we think so situation is we've got a company in the UK it's undertaking business um, in China and we've got somebody whose home is in China and they're using that as the place from which they operate to go and find us customers and they're getting paid commission for finding us customers what do we think anyone any thoughts Very good point. Is the person there an employee or a dependent uh, non-employee? Well, if they are, then it doesn't matter whether the home is used. Automatically, you've got the potential, you've at least got the potential for there being a permanent establishment just by them. That's entirely true. What about the home itself? What about the house? What do we think? What are the requirements that we need? Is it permanent? Okay, yeah, you would have thought so. Um, my, uh, you know, depending on how well built it is, but uh, I don't want to cast aspersions on the quality of build of this particular house. Looks lovely to me. So uh, it's got, we've got a house, it's permanent. Okay, great. Uh, is it at the disposal of the enterprise? Yes. Tell me why. Because the, the person living in the house is probably renting it for an extended period of time. Uh, yeah, and they've said to us, we can use, they've said they can operate from there to undertake the activities in finding us um, in finding us a um, uh, new business. Is the business carried on through the building? It could be. It could be? Yeah, it could be. Uh, it could well be. Yeah, you might be able to demonstrate that all the activity this individual undertakes, or some of it at least, is from their front room when they're ringing up potential customers and they're arranging meetings and then maybe, maybe they're inviting them around there to have meetings about what great work the, uh, the company in the UK could do for them. Okay, so does it look like it ticks the boxes, yeah? As simple as it is, yes, it could be. Um, it's all down to the manner in which you use it. So, for example, if you come to an agreement with the company in the UK, that, yeah, you're going to use that as your place of business and you're going to make mean that they can, you know, that you will work from there, then you've possibly made it available. It possibly then is at the disposal of the host of the, of the company in the UK, in my example. Uh, you could stop that happening. You could say, no, uh, look, as an ad hoc thing, I'll work from home, but it's only while, you know, it's only uh, on, the, on the few occasions when I've got nowhere else to work. And if you don't find me an office, then I don't know whether I'll allow working from home to continue. So it's not at your disposal. It's just what I'm forced to do by the circumstances. Um, you might 
uh, ensure that you're not really doing business from there or on a regular basis. So it's all down to the pattern of use, but a hat home could be, uh, just working from home could give you a permanent establishment, even where there wouldn't otherwise be a permanent establishment, because we have somebody who isn't a an employee or a dependent on the, on the company in the, uh, in the UK. So, you know, it's a borderline one, um, which is why I put it up on the screen. Uh, so it isn't a right or wrong answer. It depends upon the pattern of use and how it is actually used. Okay, here's one just for a bit of fun. Um, that's a geostationary satellite, um, and it's hovering over China. Um, it's uh, not for any espionage purposes. Uh, this is for business. Is that a permanent establishment? What's everyone think? What's everyone think the court said on this? No. Why do you say no? It depends on the case. It. <laughs> from China's Earth. You're right, actually. That, that was actually the determining factor. So you spoiled it. You spoiled it. Because uh, I was going to keep it. I was going to keep that answer for later. Uh, what, what do you, what, just out of interest, what do you think, what, what boxes does this tick? Is it permanent? Is it in a location that you can point to? Yeah, it's geostationary. Uh, is it at the disposal of the enterprise uh, who've put it up there? Starship Enterprise in this case. Uh, there was almost a joke there. It wasn't very funny. Um, uh, okay, is it a place, is it, a per is it something permanent through which the business is being carried on? Yes. Bound to be, isn't it? I mean, if you've gone to all the expense of sticking a satellite uh, up in space, you'd imagine it's doing something for your business. So there must be business coming on from it. It actually ticked all those boxes. It just wasn't in China. And uh, that was the point, that the, uh, uh, territoriality, where does it extend to? It goes all the way to the centre of the Earth. Um, so you can build anything all the way down to the centre of the Earth. It will get a bit difficult to build too far down, obviously. Uh, so that, that belongs to any country all the way to the centre of the Earth, uh, but not up into space. Uh, so there isn't a kind of segment of space that is uh, the territory within the territoriality of any country. And that was actually why that wasn't a PE. <laughs> that was the only reason why it wasn't a PE. Uh, so you got in there with the correct answer uh, straight away. Okay. We touched on this earlier on, and this is um, uh, in the model tax treaties. The model tax treaties, the OECD model tax treaties, when they're talking about permanent establishments, don't really have in mind anybody providing services. They only have in mind businesses that are kind of manufacturing or doing something, yeah, doing something tangible, doing something solid, doing something like in the oil and gas industry or doing something, you know, like mining or that kind of thing. They don't have in mind uh, businesses that are providing services. Uh, but the UN model treaty does. And it says that a permanent establishment also encompasses the furnishing of services, including consultancy, and, uh, consultant services by an enterprise through employees. Now, come back to that in a second. Uh, for the enterprise, for such purpose, but only while activities of that nature continue for the same or connected project within the state for a period or periods aggregating more than 183 days in any 12-month period. And I was having a, a conversation with one of the delegates earlier on about what that actually means or how that can be um, interpreted for a period or periods aggregating more than 183 days. But just look at one bit of wording there. Employee or other persons engaged by the enterprise. You can see that's a little bit different from the concept that we were talking about with agents and with commissioners before. Do you remember the term I used before, which Madam you did use? What do those? Sorry? Dependent. Dependent, thank you. In order for an agent or a non-employee, somebody on a contract, to become a permanent establishment, to themselves create a permanent establishment, under most OECD treaties and under the domestic law that underpins that as well, they need to be dependents of the host country, of the host company, of the company, in my example, in the UK, that has set up the business in China or wherever it is. Okay? They need to be dependent. That, it's not what it says here in the UN model treaty, which does have a services clause in it. So this is talking about a permanent establishment where services are provided, not where other activities, where tangible activities are undertaken. So it doesn't say anything about them being dependent. It just says other personnel engaged. Does everyone agree that's broader? 
personnel engaged by the enterprise, you'd imagine would include everyone. I mean, well, okay, that's the question. If you've got a company and they've got people that turn up and clean the windows of the main office, but purely on a contract basis, are they engaged by the, uh, by the, by the enterprise? I think they are, I think they're bound to be. Um, pretty much anyone's engaged. You could even apply that um, to, uh, to professionals. Uh, when, I, when I take on assignments to clients, I send them a letter of engagement. Uh, I think that means I'm engaged, engaged to provide services. So you'd imagine that's a broader definition than the dependent requirement, because dependent's different. Uh, because when I undertake an assignment for a client and we have a letter of engagement and they engage me to do that, that's one thing. I don't think I'm dependent on them. I'm only dependent on them for that contract. I'm only working with them on that contract. I'm not relying on them to supply me with a whole load of other work. So I think the point here to mention is that that is a broader uh, definition. And if people start introducing um, the, um, uh, uh, this clause, which is the UN model treaty, if they start introducing services clauses into, um, into double tax treaties, uh, either following this or following the commentary of the OECD model, which talks about suggested wording for, um, for a, a services PE, then you're more likely to see arrangements that at the moment don't create PEs creating PEs where you've got companies, businesses that are providing services in a particular jurisdiction. Yeah, everyone see that? Excellent. Okay. Now, we've talked about where we have a permanent entity, a permanent thing overseas, something at the disposal of the enterprise, something with some degree of permanence, something through which the business is conducted. Um, but what you can do is you can appoint an agent, can't you, instead of having an employee. And provided that agent isn't dependent upon the enterprise, provided they're independent of the enterprise, in other words, um, then you can undertake business uh, through that agent and not create a PE. But you've got to be quite careful. You've got to be careful for several reasons. Um, We've got that for one reason. Is it dependent? Is the person dependent on the enterprise? And there's some indication of what dependent means. Dependent are persons who are... Isn't that great? So here we go again. Uh, dependent agents. These are persons who are not independent from the enterprise. Thank you so much. I love tax. Um, so that doesn't give us that much of a clue, does it? Um, well, although it does to some extent. Because you can identify, some, somebody might call themselves an independent advisor, somebody might call themselves an independent consultant, and they might enter into an agreement with an enterprise for one particular assignment. So you'd imagine then that they are, if they hold themselves out to be independent, that would be helpful in itself. So you probably can, I'm being a bit unfair on that wording, because actually by somebody declaring themselves to be an independent contractor is probably enough to mean that they are not dependent. They're not independent of the, of the organisation. They're only dependent for, the, for that particular contract, and that isn't enough to make them not independent. So a great example, an independent financial advisor. An independent financial advisor in the UK cannot be dependent upon selling the services of one particular, uh, one particular product provider. So they can't just sell pension ideas uh, put forward by Standard Life or Norwich Union or some, or Aviva or uh, whatever they're called nowadays. They have to be acting independently and that's, 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 that's kind of implicit from their title. And the same I think you could use here. But um, whether, they, whether you, they call themselves independent or not, if they act on behalf of it and have authority to conclude contracts in its name and, and exercise that authority frequently, um, then um, basically uh, they can be dependent on the organisation. They can be a dependent of the organisation if, if they hold themselves out not to be. Factors such as level of instruction or control by the enterprise and the number of principles the agent acts for will be important in determining whether the agent is dependent or not. Uh, that's similar. This test is very similar to when we're trying to determine whether somebody is an employee or not. Um, just raise your hands again. Who is it works in employment taxes here? A couple of people working. Yep, okay. So if you work in employment taxes, you'll know what I mean. Um, we often spend a lot of time arguing with tax authorities about whether there is actually an employment contract somewhere. And 
well, there isn't an employment contract. We didn't want this person to be an employee, but do they actually have all the attributes of somebody who's an employee? And this is similar. This is similar. If basically somebody's allowed to just go off on their own and produce what they want and do it in their own way, they're probably not an employee and they're probably independent. If on the other hand we tell them exactly what to do and we demand that they do, that do it at a particular time and they have to attend a certain place uh, on particular times and dates, then they're probably starting to look independent. Uh, sorry, dependent. So the amount of control we exercise over them is important. But uh, a big one here is, um, is two things we've, we've got there is a uh, concluding contract in the name of the parent company. We'll come back to that in a second. What does that mean? And you'd imagine if somebody is concluding contracts in the name of the, country, of the company in the UK, in this example, you'd imagine that would be creating a PE, wouldn't you? Because they're quite empowered, aren't they? If they're able to actually conclude a contract in the name of my company, and I've sent them over to China just to find, find, con just to, just to find uh, clients, and I find, up that I find they've signed our company up to a whole load of work, without us even asking, then you'd imagine that looks like a PE because they've got an awful lot of autonomy, which is the other thing, and authority to do that. But they've got to be doing that still on a frequent basis. So you've actually got to have quite a lot before somebody who isn't an employee but working over in another jurisdiction does fall within this. They've got to be doing an awful lot and they've got to have quite a lot of power and you really you'd have to be trusting them quite a lot. But there is one point about um, about the contract being signed in the name of the enterprise, which is uh, quite important. I'll come on to that in just one second. The very, very simple decision tree determining whether or not an agent becomes a permanent establishment is this. Is the agent independent and acting in the ordinary course of his business? Independent, okay, we've got to worry about what that means, but if they're holding themselves out as independent, then they probably are. So if they are, then there isn't a PE. Even if they're not, even if they're dependent upon our, upon our organisation, that doesn't in itself mean that they are a constituting a PE for our organisation. They still have to have the right and frequently do uh, sign contracts for the top company. Okay? So they need to be entering into contracts that bind the top company to doing something, um, otherwise they won't fall within that definition. So it's actually quite, it's actually quite a big um, a big requirement uh, to get. It's actually quite tough to get somebody who's an independent agent within that. Now, just going back to the, uh, the BEPS actions, remember we had these categories, and action seven was prevent the artificial avoidance of PE status. So the BEPS actions are steering countries in the direction of introducing legislation or renegotiating tax treaties to mean that people aren't artificially avoiding the presence of PEs or somehow getting around PEs applying. And this is, uh, this is one, um, there's one arrangement which we'll have to worry about in this particular instance. Could we see action to stop this particular arrangement happening? Um, so um, people at the moment frequently will have what are called commissioner arrangements. There are things that are similar to that. I've touched on this already. What you might do is rather than setting up an office for the whole load of people who are going to be employed there in that jurisdiction who are going to go out and see customers, instead you ring up somebody and say, look, tell you what, you find us some customers and we'll pay you a whole load of commission. What do you say? And they say, absolutely fine. Because they're on a commission basis, because we don't empower them to enter into, well, they're certainly not dependent on us anyway, and even if they were dependent on us, we don't actually empower them to sign contracts on our behalf. They're just making introductions. That's probably fine. That's probably just a commission arrangement. Uh, and that wouldn't be create a PE, uh, PE uh, situation. But we've got to worry whether um, these changes that are likely to come through as a result of uh, BEPS Action 7, you've got to worry whether there'll be some tougher measures coming in that are aimed at catching that kind of arrangement. I think it'd be a bit mean if you catch a genuine commissioner arrangement, but I suspect it will come down to how genuine it is. And it might be that where you've got arrangements that really should be something else and you shouldn't really be using a commissioner at all, uh, then in those circumstances, I think, uh, they may fall foul of, um, of some of the changes that will come in. A simple point to make is, this is actually a bit of analysis that's taken from transfer pricing. Um, the, the greater, the, the, greater the, the, the risk and the greater the reward uh, for what's happening in the target jurisdiction, uh, 
the more under transfer pricing you need to pay for that for that service, uh, the more the higher price that uh, that commands. And you've got a similar thing in determining whether or not there's a PE, except it's the other way around. The greater they're able to demand for what they're doing, the less likely they are to be a PE. Um, so basically, if they're independent and they can earn a lot of money uh, just by charging us uh, for turning up with customers without us having to just pay them uh, a little thing and, and tell them exactly what to do, they're less likely to be a PE. So it's kind of that analysis in reverse. So, just having a look at this situation where you deliberately have a commissioner, you've got a commissioner, like I say, in my example, I keep using the same example, it'll do for the want of anything else. You've said to that commissioner, look, go away and find us some, uh, some contract. If you find us some business, then we will pay you a certain commission based on the amount of business that you bring through to us. What are the things we need to worry about in that structure? What will stop that being a PE? What could make that into a PE? Uh, well, the first thing is, um, does the commissioner enter into contracts on our behalf? Well, they might do. They might sit down with somebody and they might put in front of them an agreement for being a customer. They might say, oh, I'm working for, for Tom Morco and here's a particular contract which will govern the manner in which you do business with my uh, company in the UK. And so there might be a situation where um, the customers are being presented with some contract. So the guy could be signing contracts on our behalf. But are they legally binding contracts? That's the next one you want to look at. Because are they just presenting a standard model contract that if they sign up as a customer would be the thing they would be entering into? Or are they actually binding the company in the UK to do something? And um, are they in doing that creating some risk for the principal? So if you look at the one extreme example, if all they're doing is they're going out and they're saying to somebody, look, come and be a customer of this company in the UK, uh, they'll do a great job for you, then they ring us up in the UK and we talk about what we could do for them and they decide not to do anything with us. There's no risk, is there, for us as principal? None whatsoever. All they've done is make the, the risk has been the time in the telephone call in that example. There's no real risk in doing that. If, on the other hand, they make some commitment on our behalf, if they say we will do something provided you do X, if they say we will provide a service at this price, if they say we will provide some goods at this price, then they are presenting some risk for us as principal. And that points towards there being um, a, a, a PE in that case. So the more risk they're heaping on us, the more they're taking on, the more, they're, the more we're allowing them to take on on our behalf, the more likely it is um, that, um, that they are themselves uh, a, a, a permanent establishment. Basic thing is, if all they're doing is running around, getting us introductions, and just being, in, in my example, and just getting paid a commission for that, that won't, be a, that won't be a PE. If whatever they're doing commits us to something, and we could lose or gain as a result of that, but we're entering into some risk, then that's different. Then that is probably turning it into a PE. One important point, I don't know why that's there actually, sorry, I think the graphic's gone a bit funny. Um, the one important point here is that we talked about a commissioner becoming a PE where they have authority to include or conclude, should say, contract in the name of the enterprise, okay? But that doesn't mean they just literally conclude contracts in the name of the enterprise in the UK, in my example. If they can enter into a contract that de facto binds the enterprise back in the UK to doing something, then that's as good. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's say your entity in the UK is the only supplier of a particular product. It's the only one in the world that makes it. If our uh, commissioner goes out and concludes a contract with somebody to supply the goods that we make, being the only goods, being the only supplier of those goods in the world, then de facto we are tied into that, aren't we? Even if they've never mentioned our name, we've got to supply them. They're expecting those to be supplied and they will get sloppy if they're not supplied. And by implication, we are committed to it. Now, the legal position may be dubious on that. It may be that you've got some defence on the basis that you didn't empower this guy really to sign that contract. But we've at least got some risk because you won't look very good when the goods don't turn up. And he tells everybody these goods don't, didn't turn up and everybody knows we're the only people in the world that supply them. 
So you don't literally have to be signing a contract in the name of the company. You just have to be, it, it, it suffices for you by implication to be committing um, that, uh, that entity to entering into some kind of commitment. And on that as well, bear in mind that different, um, different countries operate subject to different laws and cultures, don't they? And so you have to be very careful on this because, um, uh, and I, I can't really do this justice in the time available, but does anyone, has anyone done any business with China at all? Can you raise your hands if you've done any business with China? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, if I said the company Chops, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Um, uh, came across this when um, we're setting up some entities in China. Uh, this isn't actually something that's creating a PE, but it just gives an indication of how different jurisdictions operate it's uh, subject to different legal rules. You have to be really careful about where you have actually made a legal commitment and where you haven't. In China, when you set up a company, uh, you get given something called the company chops. I've got no idea what these were, but um, it's a bit like when you set up a company in the UK, you, get, you used to get given a stamp that you could stamp a document with. You put a document in it, you press a stamp on it, and it has a kind of embossed stamp of the company. I don't know if they still do that anymore, um, but they used to until a few years ago. And it's a bit like that, and that's what I thought these were about. It's a kind of way that you can literally stamp a document and you say that that document is then legally, it's been signed by the company as it were. Except legally, if somebody breaks into your office and nicks your company chops and then enters into a contract using them, it is legally binding. So there's a whole business about uh, actually safeguarding the company chops and having them somewhere where somebody couldn't steal them. Because even though they've acquired them fraudulently and through a misdemeanor, it doesn't stop that being legally binding. So you just have to be careful about cross-border customs and legal practices because you might be binding somebody to something legally without knowing it. And your commissioner might be binding you to something and that's enough for that commissioner, if they're doing that habitually, to be a permanent establishment. OK, everyone with me so far? Um, now... Um, we talked about this before, but it's a very important point that most double tax treaties, all, pretty much all double tax treaties, include a list of things that are exempt from being uh, permanent establishments. And the OECD model, Article 5.4 in the model, um, it says things, it tells us things that aren't um, going to be permanent establishments, they're exempt from being permanent establishments, so even if they have all those other features, even if they are permanent, even there's a place you can point to, even if the business is carried on through that, uh, through that thing, um, then they still won't be permanent establishments if they fall within one of these exemptions. But the key thing, and I mentioned it before, is that in order to do that, all of these things we're talking about here, storage, display, processing and delivery of goods, purchase of goods, collecting information, public relations, invoicing, uh, collecting claims, research, all of those activities undertaken in um, another jurisdiction don't necessarily create a permanent establishment because they may be within one of the exemptions, provided that they are of a preparatory or auxiliary nature. And it's the auxiliary nature which is normally the one we're relying on to stop that from creating a permanent establishment. So if all you have is you have something where you're storing goods in another jurisdiction so they can be sent on to customers, then provided there's no management function going on there, that storage facility, as long as it's only a bit of what you do, as long as it's only an ancillary part of your business, your main business is making widgets, this is just where you store them, then provided it's ancillary, then you should be all right. Okay? But it is, it, just don't overlook those words, preparatory or auxiliary, auxiliary rather than ancillary, but it's a similar kind of meaning. And it's easy for... It's easy to overlook that because, you know, if you do have a business that is a storage business, if you do have a business that's a, it's a freight forwarding business or uh, something of that nature where these are a really big bit of what goes on within that business, then you can easily create a PE where other people might be able to rely on the exemption. And the general position is that any management activities, we had this before, any management activities, it's very hard for those to be considered as preparatory or auxiliary. Uh, basically, if you're managing some function from a particular place in the other jurisdiction, then almost certainly you've got something that is a permanent establishment. Or, sorry, almost certainly you've got something that doesn't qualify for one of those exemptions that we were talking about before. 
Once again, what we're saying here is that what you should be doing is you should be looking at the uh, domestic tax laws first, look at the domestic tax law to determine whether we think what we've got is something that can fall within the territoriality of that particular jurisdiction's tax. That's your starting point. Then we'll be coming on to look at uh, provisions that are contained in double tax agreements because unless the state has a right to tax a non-resident under its domestic law, it can't tax that resident under the terms of a double tax treaty, as we have established. And if you learn nothing else in this course, you'll have learned that. We know that. So you've got to, first of all, look at the domestic legislation. That's really the starting point. Then we're looking at the double tax treaty to find out whether there's any exemption within that double tax treaty that can bring us outside that, or there's any alternative definition that's included in the double tax treaty that overrides the local law definition. But there's got to be a tax charge uh, uh, that can apply at all for that to come within it. So what you're looking at is uh, you're looking first of all at the domestic law. When you've looked at the domestic law and you've established that there is a way in which the profits of this permanent establishment could be taxed in that target jurisdiction, the jurisdiction where we're doing business, you're then looking at the, um, the double tax agreement to see what specific provisions apply, to see what specific definitions apply, to see if any of the exemptions get us off the hook. And then finally, if you're still not sure, you're looking at the commentary, the OECD commentary, to find out uh, what that tells us about it. And this is a conversation I was having earlier on. Uh, we touched on the OECD commentary because I was having a, a chat with one of the delegates about whether um, a situation where you've got somebody providing services and you've got, the U, you've got that UN clause on services. The so services are being provided and they're being provided through a period spanning spanning 183 days, but the actual number of days you provide the services is less than 183 days. In fact, in this example, there are only a couple of days in July, but the thought was, well, that means July is included. There are only a couple of days in August. The thought was, well, that means August is included. And then before you know it, you can see a period during which the services were provided that spans 183 days. What's everyone think of that? So in other words, it's a services definition of permanent establishment. Uh, you've got, you can identify a period spanning 183 days, but the actual days when services are provided add up to, I don't know, 30 scattered around uh, in that. What's everyone think? Is that a permanent establishment? If you've got that services permanent establishment clause in the double tax treaty. And my answer was that what you need to look at is you do need to look at the commentary. Uh, the OECD commentary, because that will probably have some indication on that. What I think is the position is I don't think that gives you a permanent establishment under that, because I think that the intention there is pretty clear. It talks about 183 days in any 12-month period. I don't think that mean, that can mean, in terms of purposive interpretation, why would, you, why would you say 183 days in any 12-month period? You could just say, if there's a 12-month period during which you're providing some services then in that 12-month period you're caught. What's the point of 183 days? The only point I can see in linguistic interpretation is that you've got to have 183 days when you did actually provide services. So I think that's one, that's one place where going to the interpretation and seeing what, the, seeing what the, um, the, uh, the guidance says on it would actually be quite helpful. Um, just, remember, just remember that we're talking about what constitutes a PE Talk, we've said loads about when you might have a PE and when you might not have a PE. We talked about if you identify you've got a PE and you didn't think you've got a PE, then act quick and make sure it's notified in the jurisdiction where this can be taxable. Okay? But it's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? If you have a permanent establishment, it might be better that what you're doing is you, you are being taxed in that jurisdiction because then you don't have to worry about any withholding tax when, you, when you're paying something back. So there can be a situation where you can be happy to be taxed in the other jurisdiction, to take advantage of the double tax treaty that applies with that jurisdiction, and to repatriate profits with a low rate of withholding tax or zero rate of withholding tax and not be taxed, have a branch exemption in your own country. So actually it depends on the circumstances, it depends on the tax rules. It might be fine to have a permanent establishment in another jurisdiction. And so don't start with the assumption that this is bad and we want to avoid it. We don't know. You've got to look at the rules and see which works best. Agree with that? Yeah. Um, great. What's this one? Okay. Um, if you identify that you have got a permanent establishment, then yeah, 
uh, you're going to have to be treating that like an entity that's taxable in the jurisdiction where the permanent establishment is established. And so, yeah, that will mean that you're bound to have some compliance requirements in that jurisdiction. You've got to put in a tax return at least. Um, it may be that you will require information, documentation to support the fact that the profits that you are attributing to that permanent establishment are the, is the right number. So you'd have to have somewhere proving, this is quite difficult, and we'll be touching on this in a minute. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to be able to demonstrate that there are profits attributable to that permanent establishment and they're the ones that are being taxed in that jurisdiction. How did you go about calculating those profits? Where did you get that number from? And you'd need that. And there are ways in which, to the extent to which, and we'll see where this is relevant, to the extent to which you're doing that on the basis of some transfer pricing element. So you're basically saying, look, the profits attributable to the permanent establishment are, well, the income's 100, but really the cost of what we're doing on a transfer pricing arm's length basis, the cost of all the stuff we're providing and generating that 100 is 50, so that means we've got profit of 50. If you're relying on a transfer pricing analysis to come up with a number for putting a commercial price on the services being provided by that PE, uh, then you might enter into an advanced pricing agreement or something similar with the local jurisdiction. So if you've got a PE, these are the kind of things you're going to have to be getting off and doing, and this is the kind of thing the, the company's going to need some help with um, in order to keep everything above board in the jurisdiction. And, you know, um, you need an analysis where you have got a P, you need an analysis of where, which taxes apply where, um, because it, and it's not as obvious as it may seem. It's not just a case of, oh, we don't want there to be a permanent establishment. It just means that the taxes apply in a different way. So, for example, we might have corporate tax in Australia uh, there, and we might have VAT and other things in Australia uh, there where we've got a permanent establishment there, but then we might have an exemption because of a branch, ta a branch exemption from those profits in Germany. So we might not have the profits there and that might actually work out just fine. Uh, we might or may not have a withholding tax depending on what the analysis actually throws up, but that withholding tax may be fine because it may be that the rate under the double tax agreement means that we can accept that this is a permanent establishment. It is then making a payment back of fees or something else from which we, can, we would have to deduct a withholding tax, but we don't have one because of the double tax treaty. So you need to go through the process where you're analysing which taxes fall where and which withholding taxes you've got for repatriating anything. Uh, back to the uh, the UK or whichever entity it is. Oops, slide. I've already touched on this to some extent, basically. Um, the um, uh, and this is bringing me on really to the final thing, which is um, how do you really uh, in a situation like this where you have um, we've not got a commissioner now, we've got a limited risk distributor. So this is somebody who is distributing our goods. Uh, but with very limited risk, we're really retaining most of the risk associated with this. So, for example, they might not have inventory or stock risk. We might basically agree to provide them with a whole load of goods to supply, but if they don't sell them, we'll take them all back. It may be that we're taking on board the currency risks. So in those circumstances, you may well have, that's the kind of situation where you will also potentially have uh, a, uh, a PE uh, where you've got, um, where you've got a, um, a limited risk distributor. Again, the greater the risk this person is taking upon themselves, upon themselves, the less likely it is that they constitute a PA. The greater to the extent to which we're taking on the risk, we are shouldering all the potential burden of any commercial loss to them, the more likely that is to be a permanent establishment for us. So, you know, broadly, I'll summarise it like this. Um, You've got, to have, you've got to have this situation to have a permanent establishment. You've got to have two jurisdictions. You've got to have one jurisdiction where you've got a legal entity. You've got to have another jurisdiction being the place in which you're carrying on some kind of business. Uh, but, you, so, but you don't need a legal entity there. This is just the country in which you're carrying on a, uh, a business. And the question is, have you crossed the line from doing business with that country into doing business in that country? And all those definitions we've been talking about, about when you do and don't have a permanent establishment, all the exemptions that can get you off the hook of having a permanent establishment, they're all the things that we're going to be, uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, you're going to be considering to determine whether or not one does exist. And just remind yourself of these, uh, this terminology, a fixed place of business through which the business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. Fixed place, 
and the business actually carried on through it. Not always obvious, um, not always, but often can save you with some things where you, know, you think, well, it is a fixed place, it is a building, but actually the business isn't carried on there. So it's not always obvious that you're going to be caught by these things. Um, and of course, the exemptions, which we rely on a lot, we do rely on, and certainly when you get into building sites and building sites being under 12 months, um, we rely on a lot uh, to stop there being uh, permanent establishments. But just remember that there is that catch-all on those, that the activity does need, to be, uh, does need to be preparatory or auxiliary to the main activity. Okay, um, very, I'm going to quickly run through, and I'm just going to keep this very, very short. Um, because uh, we're running out of time. This is mainly, the next session is really to do with how you actually attribute profits um, to, uh, to permanent establishments because what will be taxable in the entity where the permanent establishment is based is the profits attributable to that permanent establishment, okay? And only those profits attributable to that permanent establishment. But what are they? And we'll be coming on to look at that in just a second. Now, it comes back to this basic principle. Business profits of an enterprise of a contracting state shall be taxable only in that state unless the enterprise carries on a business in the other contracting state through a permanent establishment situated therein. If the enterprise carries on a business force, then the profits that are attributable, there we go, to the permanent establishment in accordance with the provisions of paragraph 2 may be taxed in that other state. Where profits include items of income which are dealt with separately in other articles of this convention, then the provisions of those articles should not be affected by the provision of this article. All that is telling you is that if actually you've got something coming in via that permanent establishment, which is actually dealt with somewhere else, let's say interest that's coming back to us, let's say a royalty payment, then they'll be covered by different articles under the, under the double tax treaty. You don't need to worry about them. So there you get taken out of the equation. Everything else that we can identify uh, through a process we go through is basically going to be um, business, uh, profits um, attributable to the permanent establishment. So we take out anything dealt with elsewhere under the double tax treaty. Everything else may be profits that are, uh, that are um, uh, profits of the of the um, of the permanent establishment. And the rules here don't work very kindly at all in terms of if you if you're operating in a high tax jurisdiction, they don't work very kindly at all. Because the basic principle is um, all of the legislation that most countries have and most of the international rules try and chuck everything into the pot to be taxed in the permanent establishment and in the high tax jurisdiction. Um, and uh, it says it does not extend to the profits that the enterprise may derive from that state but are, are not attributable to the permanent establishment. Well that's helpful. We've got to work out what is actually attributable to the permanent establishment um, and uh, that's the million dollar question. But the point is it's not just things that are going on in the permanent establishment. It can be things going on in the wider enterprise and you can end up with some really odd example, really odd um, uh, um, kind of results on this. And has anyone, if I to use the phrase force of attraction approach, does that mean anything to anybody? Okay. Um, in international law, there are a couple of approaches that have been suggested for how you actually go about attributing the profits that are attri working out the profits that are attributable to a permanent establishment. And one concept, which isn't really the favoured concept at the moment, uh, there's a there's a more technical uh, approach that's normally favoured now. But one concept is what was normally termed the force of attraction approach. It's a pompous way of saying everything sticks to the PE. So basically, anything that is going through the PE, uh, any profit. Uh, really, the, you can attribute to the PE if it's, um, uh, well, pretty much anything, including, uh, uh, so you could have the entirety of the profit of the whole organisation taxed via the PE. That's a full force of attraction approach. That isn't normally actually in practice taken. There's a sort of middle ground force of attraction approach, which is that it's anything actually going through the PE plus anything going through the host company, through the main, through the top company, which is of a similar nature to that going through the PE. Still pretty broad, isn't it? Um, but the approach that's normally favoured, uh, and most countries will do this, is a more technical approach where you're going through an analysis of the functionality of the permanent establishment. And this could actually occupy a whole course. It'll be a pretty dull course, um, but I won't take you through much of this. And I'm certainly not going to look at all the words um, uh, on these because there's too many words on there. Um, but there's a couple of points that come out from that. Um, one is, 
um, even on a functionality approach, it is the profits that you will attribute to the PE that can be taxed in that potentially higher tax jurisdiction. That doesn't necessarily mean that you've got anything profitable here in real life. So in other words, what you might have is you might hideously have a situation where that's a company, let's say, in the UK. I'll do it like that. It's got an entity. There you go. There's the border. It's got an entity in another country. We'll call it uh, Japan. We establish that that is a PE. Okay. But actually, when we look at the whole thing that this company is carrying on, it's loss making. It's not doing very well at all. And it's loss making because actually this UK entity has other functions in different, different parts of the world and they're not doing very well at all. And the UK part of the business isn't doing very well at all. So the whole thing is doing really bad, really badly. That does not mean there is no profit attributable to the permanent establishment. You might have a profit attributable to the permanent establishment. And in those circumstances, you can see the rules work out really badly, don't they? Because you get a tax charge in Japan, notwithstanding the fact that if you had no PE, not only would not have a tax charge, I've carried forward losses. I mean, you'll never, you won't have a tax charge for ages. So you'd actually be getting a deduction from next year's tax liability. So the rules can work uh, very, very uh, badly in, in those situations. And how do you go about concluding whether, the, uh, whether this entity here is actually profit-making or loss-making? And the, uh, the, um, the, the favoured approach, if I can get my IT ever to work, the favoured approach is that you're working on, um, I'm going to flick over these, you're working on a um, functionality uh, kind of approach. So what you're looking at is you're looking at what the business really does. And you're breaking it down into different streams of income in that business. And you're looking at each stream and you're looking at all the functions that are required to produce that stream of income. Okay, so you're looking at, you're trying to work out what it looks like as a freestanding business. It's not an independent freestanding business, but you're trying to imagine what it would look like as a freestanding business. What would it be earning? Then for all the things it's doing, for all the functions it's got, you're working out the cost of each of those functions. Okay, everyone get that? Okay, so you're working out that, yeah, in order to carry out that particular function there, it needs 10 staff. Okay, those 10 staff are actually provided by the stuff that the people in the UK do. Okay? But you're working out all the functions it has and all the costs associated with each of those functions, all the different streams of income rather that it has and all the costs associated with those streams of income, the different functions in other words. And then you're working out the cost of anything that isn't provided third party, you're working out the cost on the transfer pricing mechanism. So you're working out what would be the real life cost of doing that and thereby you're working out the profitability of that, of that, of that uh, permanent establishment. It's logical really and there's an awful lot on these slides that don't explain that particularly well, if I'm honest. Um, so I've skipped over them. Um, but that's ultimately what it comes down to. And so it's a kind of two or three stage process that you're going through to work out. But ultimately, you're really working out what the business really is. Does that make sense? But the, the, like I said, the oddity with that is that you can have a situation where you do have, um, where you do have um, uh, a non-profitable overall business. You have something which isn't overall profitable, but you still do have a profit that's taxed um, in, the, um, in, the, in, in the higher tax country. So just recapping a little bit, what this is all about is you've got a business, so you've got something in the UK, let's say, it's carrying on, it's doing business in this jurisdiction, or is it doing business with this jurisdiction or in this jurisdiction? We don't know. If it's doing business in that jurisdiction, then you've got an entity there that can be taxed there. And the whole tax analysis of everything looks totally different. You may have a little less that's taxed here. Where that works out really badly is if you've got no profit overall here and you could still have something that's taxed there. Um, okay. Uh, if, you, if you don't have a PE, then all you've got is you've got business profits that are coming into this entity here, and then you're following the normal double tax treaty to look at how those business profits are taxed and whether there's any withholding tax on the payments of those business profits. But if you assume that you have got a PE, then you have to go through this process of working out how you attribute those profits to the PE. And like I said, I've touched on um, the, what we're doing here. We are trying to imagine this as a separate and independent enterprise. Uh, 
that's hard to do because it ain't a separate and independent enterprise. So we have to kind of cut it and draw it up and imagine what it would look like if it were. Imagine what a set of accounts for this business would look like. That's hard when it's only undertaking a particular function, isn't it? That's a bit like saying, what would the accounts of the, of the uh, HR department here look like? Well, how do you wear that out? The HR department doesn't make any money. It's an overhead, they tell us here. Sorry if anyone's working in HR. Uh, so how do you work that out? So you have to imagine it as an independent business and you have to imagine how it would function and what its different streams of income would be and what it would be coming through that and then to work out what the cost of generating those would be. That's the, that's the basic approach that is, um, that is required from this. I'm not going to go through all these because we've run out of time. But this is, uh, this is really a long-winded way of saying what I've been telling you there, that you are breaking it down into the, individual, into the individual functions of the business and you're imagining what they would, uh, what they would generate and you're applying transfer pricing rationale. So you are looking at comparable businesses to see what they would be charging to, get to, to cover the cost base of the things that are required to produce that income. There will be a link in what we're sending you with the slides to mean that you can go and have a look at the OECD report uh, that uh, talks about permanent establishments. A practical point coming out of this is that you can contractually determine, to some extent, where you've got a permanent establishment and where you haven't. You might enter, enter into a contract with one entity where you're accepting that you have a permanent establishment and have separate contracts covering other things where you're trying to avoid there being a permanent establishment. So actually splitting what you're doing into different contracts and having different people down here undertaking them is a way of picking and choosing where you really have a permanent establishment. And that, that, can, be, that can actually be um, a way of doing things. Uh, there were so many words in all those slides I couldn't have time, didn't have time to go through most of them. But ultimately that's all it is. You're trying to imagine what it would look like as an independent, a genuine independent business you're ripping it out of its visceral connection with the UK company in our case, and you're trying to look at what it looks like on its own. And the only way you can imagine that is using transfer pricing methodology to imagine what it would have to pay for the things that are keeping it alive and making it perform. That's what it's about. Okay? So that's all I've been covering.